Well, good evening, Vern, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, our 33rd lockdown series lectures. Apologies for being slightly delayed with work this evening, Brian, but I'm delighted to have the support of our uh, secretary and our immediate past master, brother Robert Clark, beavering away behind the scenes to ensure everything goes smoothly. As usual, Brian, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidance on Zoom meetings that I need you to have your videos on and a name there so we know who you are. As ever, can I ask you to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages? And if you've got any questions later on for Dr. John Reuther, please put them in the chat and we'll have a moderated discussion afterwards. As usual, Brian, this meeting is being recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube pages later on this evening. So it's a great pleasure, Brian, to welcome along my bro brother, Dr. John Reuther who a Freemason from down south, uh, he's a medical man, Brian, and uh, we might be able to uh, question him about the, the current pandemic because he's into microbiology his, uh, and he's got a doctorate in the Faculty of Medicine at St. Thomas's Hospital down in London. And most of his working career has been in medical microbiology. Uh, very, upper, very important nowadays. He's been a Freemason since 1973 in the province of Essex, and he's been the senior warden in the province of East Kent and the junior grand deacon in the Grand Lodge of England. He's a very keen lecturer in the history of Freemasonry, and he was the Cornwallis lecturer in 2003. And he's also a trustee of the Royal Masonic Benevolent Institution in 2006, and he was appointed the deputy president of that very worthwhile charity in 2013. Dr. John, it's a great privilege and pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, and the floor is now yours, sir. Thank you very much. First surprise of the evening, I didn't expect to see my son's father-in-law in front of me. Um, that's James Gorham. So uh, anyway, uh, you've asked me to talk about the American Civil War, uh, and it will, first of all, really, the, the role Freemasonry played is very much from the sideline. It didn't actually or wasn't involved in any political decisions made or anything else. Um, but clearly, as it's Freemasonry has done in virtually every conflict that we can have in living memory, uh, that it has got itself involved in various aspects of it, mainly dealing with combatants and things like that. But if we look at the Civil War, it's a very complex subject. Uh, it, uh, what were the causes of it? I mean, everybody basically thinks, oh, the that they wanted to get rid of slavery. Interestingly enough, I've only seen getting rid of slavery as being one of the reasons for doing it in the last few months, possibly as a result of the uh, uh, current problems with um, uh, Black Lives Matter and that sort of stuff. Well, it's not a problem, but the, the issue there. But prior to that, the, the, uh, people would say openly that Lincoln wasn't that particularly worried about um, the, getting rid of slavery. But I think, it's a much more complex subject than that. And I think you really have to look at a couple of things first to get it in pictures. Um, the first thing to really look at is what did the average uh, American at that time think of his role in relationship to the United States of America? Well, in on the whole, most of them would consider themselves as, for example, a Virginian first and an American second. And it was the United States of lots of different independent states in their own right. Yes, they would share common factors, which they got together and sought out within Washington and places like that. But on the whole, they were independent. When Lincoln came to the uh, uh, um, presidency, uh, he was a well-known abolitionist. And many of them were very, very concerned that abolitions, abolitionists would be imposed upon them within their own states. Now, I think to be best look at that, you have to look at the state of Mississippi. In 1860, Mississippi on its own right was the fourth largest uh, employment, um, uh, financial officer. Hang on a second. Well, it appears that my son is now looking, um, but it's the fourth largest economy in the world. Now, when you think you're looking at one state, with the fourth largest economy, you can then see how important the whole complex of cotton was in that particular time. In fact, it was called King Cotton. Uh, 
cotton was incredibly important. And the fundamental thing that was different between the North and the South was in the North, they were arable farmers on the whole, although highly industrialized um, and um, tended to be made up of a lot of immigrants from Central Europe. If you look to the South, historically, everybody says that they were uh, English. They were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, basically, uh, descended from the people who came over in the 1600s, 1700s. That, again, is now modified because there were at least 40,000 Irish and Scots living in the southern states of America. Uh, and so the whole thing is quite, quite complex in that area. But clearly, money is involved. Money was a very important part of it. And to have the idea where in the north they were arable and paid people, and in the south they didn't, they had slaves. If they had their slaves taken away from them, could they afford to make all the money for America, the United States? And this was a big debate. Um, interestingly enough, majority of Southerners, particularly in Mississippi, for example, would never have had a slave. It was literally only uh, about 9% of the big planters who would have the majority of the slaves. And Mississippi was one of the only states where in fact, um, there were um, uh, more uh, blacks than there were actually whites in it, certainly at the time of the Civil War. But there was another factor. There were many, many sl slave states, especially places like Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, um, who actually were slave states, but stuck to the Union. So again, it wasn't a clear cut thing. But really to throw it into the, the, the melting pot, you have to really go back to the end of the 19th century when George Washington died. At that time, in the American War of Independence, he had at least 14,000 Freemasons fighting for him. And one of the reasons they won, they won was the contact scenario that Freemasonry has in a closed environment. And, and this was a highly successful um, uh, method, it worked. But within 20 years, Freemasonry was nearly extinct. It was virtually wiped out. Um, the reason for it was a particularly unpleasant affair called the Morgan Affair. Now, the Morgan Affair was when a particular man, William Morgan, who had or put himself around as being a hero of the 1812-1814 Naval War, when the Americans fought against um, uh, the British. And the war ended up as a draw, but uh, the, the British did, in fact, burn the White House down and they had to paint it white. Hence, that's why it's called the White House. Um, it was ended, as I say, in, in, in more or less a draw. The British maintained Canada from then onwards, and that was that. But one particular man, this Morgan chap, suddenly appeared in upstate New York, uh, saying he was a Freemason, and that really um, he wanted to uh, join one of the lodges up there. Well, someone clearly knew him and uh, objected strongly to him joining. It was a chapter he was trying to join. Um, and uh, he then was approached by a local publisher, a paper, um, newspaper man uh, called, um, uh, well, the name slipped to my mind for a present, David Miller. Uh, and David Miller uh, persuaded him to do one of these exposés. Well, th this led to the fact that this is probably one of the only Masonic murders that's ever been recorded, because literally shortly after that, the local Freemasons burnt down the, um, the press and, and uh, the, the newspaper and went on further than that. They went on to capture him, took him up to uh, Nicar uh, the uh, uh, Lake Niagara or near there, and he disappeared, never to be seen again. Very quickly, they arrested the Freemasons who'd taken him and accused them of abduction and potentially murder. Uh, the local sheriff, however, let them out and bail and wasn't particularly worried about it because he was a Freemason with them. Uh, but the more important Freemasons in places like New York and Boston began to get extremely concerned about this. At the same time, a number of religious people um, really uh, thought Freemasonry was extremely corrupt and uh, really should not be allowed. And this sort of steamrolled until eventually 
Free, Freemasonry was actually banned in the state of Vermont. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, was banned in the state of Vermont and banned in many other states. Uh, it only came to the, uh, the rescue by Andrew um, Jackson, who was the victor, if you remember, of the Battle of New Orleans, which was in 1814, not in 1820, as Lonnie Donegan assumed it to be. Um, and uh, uh, it was fought after the war had ended, but the news hadn't got there. And of course, they beat the British and he was a, a, a hero throughout America. Consequently, when he um, stood for presidency, the, there were three other candidates, and one of them was the anti-Masonry party. But in fact, because he was so popular, Jackson got in, and Jackson did a number of exceedingly good um, deeds during that time, getting rid of a lot of uh, corruption that was in the, the certainly in the Treasury. And it, it, within a few years, the anti-Masonry virtually disappeared. A number of quite eminent people gave up Freemasonry because of it though, and the most famous of those was in fact John Brown, who was a Freemason, um, and uh, uh, John Brown or John Brown's body. Um, and he took to sort of not only liberating slaves, but at the same time to try and catch, ca catch uh, capture the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Um, he was easily captured and was executed. But in 1860, his song became or the song about him became the major uh, driving force behind Lincoln, who really only got in because there were two other uh, Democrats who really wanted or so against themselves that if the combined vote of those two, they could have outdone Lincoln. But unfortunately, Lincoln was in and that's when the trouble really started. Now, there have been other um, uh, Freemasons who were present up until that time, Polk, who had laid the cornerstone at the Smithsonian Institute, and uh, was very, very keen on expansion into the West, into the unknown territories. Um, and again, um, uh, this was unpopular, again, with the anti-Mason society, who really wanted to remain in the East. Um, and there were others. Buchanan was another one who, again, an eminent Freemason, um, but uh, really uh, would rather have kept the South where the South was and not get involved with the war. Eventually, it began to get to a situation where people began to be threatened. States began to be threatened and they began to sort of secede away from the Union, which they thought was perfect. They were perfectly entitled to. And one by one, the southern states seceded and moved away from the, um, the Union and started up their really Confederate Union uh, under the um, uh, uh, Virginians um, in, um, in, in Virginia. Virginia itself split into two. One half joined the Union, and that was West Virginia, and the other half stayed with the South. And of course, uh, the great general, Robert E. Lee, when he resigned from the Confederacy, had to join, join the, org, the Army of the North Virginia. Um, and so he was a member of the Virginian campaign uh, and broke away along with half the officers at West Point. So this is the beginning of it. When did the war start? Well, in the time that Buchanan was the um, uh, president just before Lincoln was actually appointed. He'd been elected, but he hadn't been installed. Uh, they decided to take a lot of the ammunition out of the various of forts that were in the South. And of course, one of the biggest ones, which was already uh, 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 um, uh, seceded, was at Fort Sumter, which was in Charleston. And uh, a very eminent Freemason in the South, Beauregard, uh, who was a big Knights Templar man, and an artillery man and an engineer uh, decided he would capture it and so set about uh, bombarding it. The poor devil who was inside it uh, was in fact also a Freemason, belonged to Mercer Lodge, um, and he was in the north. And, and the, 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 they were bombarded for two days. There was only one death, and that occurred when the federal uh, uh, um, garrison uh, decided to leave and blew up a barrel of, of dynamite just to and was blown himself up so sadly that was the only death on the occasion uh, but once that started Lincoln immediately called in seven for 70,000 volunteers from the north 
And it was the beginning of the Civil War, which started April the 12th, 1861. The, um, North, the war would be quite interesting in that it was very much a war of attrition. Uh, they knew that the North knew it had unlimited, probably three times more numbers of men than the South. For every dead uh, Southerner, he could not be replaced. And so it was the first real war of attrition. So how did Freemasonry get involved in it? Well, each, um, uh, I'm loath to call them province, each state um, would have had its own Masonic setup. And it had been very, by this time, very large. But each of them were absolutely adamant they were not going to form a united Grand Lodge, for want of a better description, of America. Each one was going to be independent and act independently. Again, a fundamental thing where they distance themselves from the war. And they would be involved in many other aspects of care, help, and all sorts of things whilst the war went on. Uh, on one occasion, when uh, the, the uh, um, American, the Federal Navy, was coming up the um, uh, Mississippi from um, the, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, HMS well, wouldn't be the American ship Albatross, unfortunate name really, the captain committed suicide. He was a well-known Freemason and really they didn't want to bury him at sea or in the river uh, for a variety of reasons. And so they rowed ashore a, 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 a white um, flag job and spoke to the local Masonic Lodge and said, we would like our brother here to have a Masonic funeral to which uh, the local lodge in the South said, by all means, we hate you because you're Yanks, but on the other hand, that you're a brother and we will help you. I've got a problem coming up. I can see my computer wants to close down. So uh, it will be a short break and I'll get it back together again. Um, anyway, um, this was duly done and he had a full Masonic funeral. Uh, uh, Masonic funerals were in fact quite, um, um, common in those days, you rarely see them apart from, certainly in England, I'm sure it's the same in Scotland, apart from a set square and compass at the end of the coffin. But they were quite ornate 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, so uh, the involvement of Freemasonry was limited. Uh, some lodges, provincial, uh, state lodges we'll call them, uh, were quite happy that you are a American first and there you will kill the Confederate being Mason or Mason not, where others had a totally different viewpoint and said you're a Mason first, you will help a brother without a hindrance uh, or, or without detriment to yourself or connection, the standard uh, 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 words for this thing. Um, when they did try to produce a United Grand Lodge of, uh, 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 which was in Kentucky, they started negotiating to have one between them. Uh, it all went pear-shaped and none of them would talk to each other for a while. So it was never going to happen. As in some respects, you could compare it between the Grand Lodge of Scotland and the United Grand Lodge of England. You know, uh, we, we'll always be separate, but we are uh, combined in many other aspects of, of brotherly love and everything else. The um, first major uh, battle of the day occurred with the uh, the Confederates rather quickly came out and began to attack Washington at a place called Bull Run. It's known as the first battle in Bull Run in the north, but it's known as the uh, Battle of, the, uh, of Manassas um, in, in the south. <laughs> Yeah, that's all right. It just comes up like this every so often. I beg your pardon. Anyway. And <clears throat> it was going to be so easy. The North were going to come out there, knock seven bells out of the, the Southerners. Um, you know, these country folk, what do they know? Um, and um, uh, lo and behold, it, 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 it totally backfired, mainly due to uh, the heroic actions of one particular man who got his nickname from that day, which was Stonewall Jackson. He stood so firm that the actual um, uh, regiments were be able to, to maneuver around him. And of course, there's one classic Masonic instance which sums up 
them all up and virtually every battle has got a incidence where there is a Masonic incident. Um, and this is when um, at, uh, a Colonel Rayner of the 1st Ohio Cavalry, um, so he's a northerner, uh, takes his horse uh, and, and um, two other uh, cavalrymen down to the local river to drink water. And suddenly he's, find, he's surrounded by a load of uh, rebels. And uh, one takes a pot shot at, at him, which uh, grazes his head, and knocks him unconscious. And the other one, in fact, then um, uh, shoots him in the foot. So he's got a bad foot and a bad head and he's lying unconscious. When he wakes up, he's surrounded by um, a, a cavalry um, from, um, uh, well, I can't remember the regiment, but he's surrounded by a cavalrymen from the south. And one of them goes over and then gives him back all the things that's been stolen from him over the last hour that he's been unconscious and says, you know, that I didn't, uh, we didn't realize that you were a brother and makes the comment. And he said, why did you, you, you help us? He said, and his comment was, I only hope to get the same treatment from your men if ever I fall into their hands. If you relieve the distress of a brother Mason, when you are uh, in, when, when in your power, I shall be well paid. And, and that was from uh, Lennon, who was on the, uh, uh, the first battle of, of Manassas. That's the name of the chat. They did meet up years later after the war. But it's the nice instance. And that is typical of so many of the uh, events that, that, that did occur. Again, uh, uh, shortly after that, the, the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, again, this is when the Americans are beginning to realize they have bitten off more than they can chew. Every single battle they had began actually um, outnumber that 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 that, that um, are outnumbered by those who died in the American Civil War quite a frightening figure and again, a classic difference, if we talk about our great battles, i.e. the Battle of Waterloo, for argument's sake, it lasted five hours. The Battle of Gettysburg lasted three days. Shiloh lasted two days. And these are the sorts of things there. But in the Battle of Shiloh, a, a, a surgeon, a, a, a captain, um, uh, was captured by, uh, and he was a southerner was captured by the, um, no, he was a northerner and he was captured. Um, and um, uh, he was asked when he, uh, why wasn't I killed? And he said, well, we know you, we've been watching you over the last few months. And when in Lawrenceville, uh, the Union Army was going to burn down the local lodge rooms, you and your men prevented it from happening. That's why you're alive today. And they again helped him back to his own lines, and uh, uh, that was that was the end of that. Um, Farragut um, was another interesting guy. He was a southerner, but in fact stayed with the Union. He was a member of a Masonic lodge, and he was in the American Navy, um, and he was given the task of going uh, around the South, go up the Mississippi and capture New Orleans, which he did. Uh, he put a, an army general in charge, who was another Freemason, who made a pig's ear of it. Um, what he did, in fact, was to threaten to lock up the women, because the American soldiers the, the, who had captured it would be walking along the streets in New Orleans when suddenly a piss pot would be pulled out over their head from the, the balconies above the, the streets in, in, in uh, New Orleans. And uh, uh, of course, they, they got rather upset about this. And the, the butler, who was the uh, general controlling uh, that, threatened to have them locked up in prison like common whores. Well, this was contrary to our, the Americans, um, or the Southerners thought women were. Women were to be looked after and cared for. And the idea of a Northern general crudely saying, you will be locked up like a common whore, uh, was contrary against them, and there were various odd retaliations against the occupational army. And in the end, Farragut had to sack him to keep the peace. 
<laughs> and um, incidents where people were helped can no better be shown than perhaps at the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, Battle of Gettysburg, 1863, there were two battles, more or less at the same time. I'll talk about Vicksburg first, because Vicksburg is probably more interesting. Again, on uh, the river, the Mississippi going south, um, was occupied and, and, and surrounded by the Union Army coming from the north. However, there was a gap of about 50 miles where the south controlled. If the Union Army could break it, then in fact no food could get through uh, across the, you know, from the uh, Kansas and the uh, air areas out west where the food was coming in. And so it was like a strategic thing to take Vicksburg. Well, by a variety of means um, of, of going out maneuvering the, um, uh, uh, the Southerners, um, uh, General Grant, who had a very bad reputation at this time, because he was a good general, he was the best general the North had, but he had a very bad reputation uh, for being a drunk, and whether he was or not, or whether it's just bad propaganda, I don't know, nor does anybody else for that matter. Um, and by a series of very clever strategic moves, the Confederate commander of Vicksburg was a uh, name Pe Pemberton, uh, wasn't a particularly good uh, soldier. He, he'd never been to a, a military training college at all. Um, and eventually, after a great deal of fighting, they did manage to cut the supply of food off to Vicksburg. Vicksburg eventually was obliged to surrender because it was starved out, basically. And the Freemasons went into, um, the, the, the Northern Freemasons from the army went into Vicksburg and found the Masonic Lodge and got to know the Freemasons are in there who were Confederate officers. And so they had a meeting. And at the meeting, every single post within the lodge room, from the master, the wardens, the deacons, all the way down, was shared by a Confederate officer, a Union officer, a Confederate officer, a Union officer. And they met there and they had a massive banquet because they'd been living on horse flesh, um, cats and dogs and God knows what else. And they had this magnificent banquet because the Union forces were quite well off at this stage before they went into prison. Um, and this is another example of the two armies and their masons in them getting together. The news of Vicksburg and what an important victory that was, was greatly overshadowed by what happened next, and that was the largest battle in the American Civil War. And this is the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is where, synonymously, Freemasons are depicted, most likely. There was something like about 40,000 Freemasons at that battle on both sides. <clears throat> some of them, or most of them, were, were a lot of them were high ranking, but some of them were just ordinary um, uh, men uh, uh, and, and and that was it, really. It was also where, for the first time, uh, and a Union soldier uh, fired a bullet from a gun made by a Freemason against another Freemason. It was the first time that it was mentioned. It was a particular Sharp's gun, and Sharp was a Freemason. The battle lasted three days. What had happened was Lee had broken out, and he was being pursued by Meade. Uh, Meade was a general who re really didn't play a big role in the war, but at this battle was the way he outmaneuvered Lee, which was the only uh, Union officer ever to do so. Uh, the Union forces were on the run and they had to retreat back through the town where they were massacred by the Confederate forces. The Confederate forces outnumbered them. And so they retreated to the highland on top of Cemetery Hill to form a ring around it. And the various forces attacked on all different sides and the battle went on exceedingly bloodily all that day. And it's the occasion where the Irish from the south fought the, a regiment of Irish from the north. And the comment was made is, what are we brothers doing fighting each other when we should be fighting the bloody English? Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, 
it didn't stop the war. I don't think anything would have done at that stage. Um, but the, the, the number of Americans in the States by this time after 1848 and the potato famine were enormous. One of the most important men who saved the day on that was a Freemason um, whose, whose name uh, is um, uh, Chamberlain. Uh, Lawrence Chamberlain uh, came from uh, uh, New England, um, from Maine. Uh, he was a classic scholar. Um, he became a priest um, and he eventually he headed up running Bowdown School, which was a public school in Maine. Um, him and his brother uh, took over as the uh, general of the 20th Maine Infantry. And he was on Little Round Top. And the uh, Confederates had almost broken through and nearly broke through. And if they broke through, they'd break the whole line up the top there. It was Chamberlain who suggested, who, who ordered that they fix bayonets and they charged downhill. And to charge downhill, the momentum just carried the line and it saved the Union Army from being massacred uh, as, they, as, as the Confederates broke in. Chamberlain was a very, very uh, high ranking Freemason in, in the, the main area. The next day is probably the most famous uh, part of the battle, which is to charge the Pickett's Charge, a ridiculous concept. But the idea was that uh, Meade's artillery were at the top of a hill, firing down on uh, a mile away where uh, Pickett's troops, a large number of, of, of infantry, began to advance. The um, uh, Confederate cavalry, uh, artillery had bombarded the top of the hill. So there were a lot of casualties on top of the hill. And of course, Pickett, who was a Freemason, on his horse, led them up the hill, and it was a mile and a half to walk. And they were mowed down, lock, stock and barrel, and the cream of the Confederacy were killed there. One of the characters who was killed there he was wounded on, uh, on, on, on Pickett's charge, was a man called um, Armstead. And Armstead had been at West Point, and his best friend was Hancock. And Hancock fought for the North, and in fact, Hancock controlled the army on top of the hill, the Union. And both of them were badly wounded. The thing that comes out of this is that there was a captain called Bingham, who um, uh, was a Union man, but he was known by Armistead from when they were in the army together. And he said, look, my best friend is General Hancock. Can you give him my Masonic um, things that I want, you know, that I've got, that, so that they can go to him as my closest friend? He then, two days later, died. And from this comes a number of events. The most one of them is a bit bizarre right now because it doesn't actually speak too highly. Um, is the the song Two Little Boys Had Two Little Toys, each had a wooden horse. And of course, <clears throat> that in theory relates to uh, Amstead and um, Hancock. As it was, Hancock survived and was given the, the thing. The end product was, as so many Freemasons died in that battle. They created a Masonic memorial, which every year the lodges from all over the country attend. They parade through the town of Gettysburg. They meet up with uh, their reenactment groups and they conduct this. Um, but very, all virtually nearly all the grand officers from that area uh, all attend as well. Um, and it's quite an annual event. And the monument itself um, has Amstead lying on the ground, handing to Bingham his Masonic jewellery and everything else that he carried into battle. And uh, on that, that memorial, um, it's got engraved in it, the friend of a friend, uh, to a friend Masonic memorial at Gettysburg will help to demonstrate to the world that Freemasonry is indeed a unique fraternity, that its bonds of friendship compassion and brotherly love withstood the ultimate test during the most tragic and de decisive period of our nation's history. 
It stood then as it stands now as a brotherhood undivided. Now, one of the uh, senior officers controlling the top of the hill at this stage was again, uh, Lawrence um, um, Chamberlain. And he ended up with the uh, um, highest, the Victoria Cross or whatever description of the American uh, army. Um, he also turns up again in the history of the American Civil War. Right at the very end, when they were surrendering, the um, Southern was surrendering at Appomattox Courthouse. And ironically, there's only a few days difference. It was in April, 1865, and it started in April, 1861. Uh, when they were surrendering, in theory, they were meant to be disarmed. Lee was persuaded by Chamberlain not to do that. Not Lee. Grant was persuaded by Chamberlain not to do that, but to let them go with full honours. And so the band played up, they got into line, and the Confederate army marched between the Federal army as it lined up either side to end the Civil War. Whether the Civil War has ever ended, your guess is as good as mine. And I was at a, a lodge meeting in uh, Kent, not that long ago, when two Americans turned up, they came from Alabama. And we had one character who was a bit of a mouthy sod, who kept saying to them, well, you Yanks and this, that and the other. And this guy suddenly turned with a broad Alabama accent and said, hey, man, why are you all about the Yanks? Where I come from, we're still fighting them. And so it, they're literally, it still lives on to this current day. It, it's never really recovered. And as I say, what is changing, which is rather interesting, is our slavery now is the reason why the Americans are giving up um, the idea that the, the war wasn't about slavery. More and more of them are saying, look, we were the good guys in the end. The northern states got rid of it. In 1863, in January, they were de declared freed anyway, but as most of them lived in the South. It's ironic that those blacks who escaped to the north before the war were actually sent back south. And many of them used the north to get to Canada. A uh, classic person who did that was, was a guy called Joseph H H Henson, who was a slave who escaped into Canada. And he joined a, a, a craft lodge in Ottawa, uh, Ontario. And he's thought to be the subject who Uncle Tom is based upon. So the war ended was masonry involved? Not politically, but it did play an important role within what, but the nice thing about it, it maintained its integrity uh, at a time when everybody was fighting each other. And ironically, I do a talk on the First World War <clears throat> and um, uh, lodges around our neck of the wood, we had a lot of Canadians around our area and we used to issue them with Masonic passports written in French, German and uh, English. And basically it said, if you meet a German or a, a Mason who is a German who, and you're captured, uh, show him this. And it basically said, please look after our brother. We will make it up to you when we, the war has ended. Um, and these Masonic passports were sought after so much because certainly the role of Freemasonry in the First World War played a very, very important part in, in the camp system, in prisoner of war camps, especially civilian ones, but that's another talk. Um, so really that's more or less ending uh, the, the uh, talk. It's gone on for 40 minutes as I was briefed. Um, and I do hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah. I want to say for, I want to say from America that was very interesting to hear it from an English perspective. In history class, we talk for a long time about the Civil War and its many causes. But thank you, thank you for sharing a, a neutral neutral perspective. Well, I don't know if the English were neutral, in fact, because remember, when the cotton didn't come over here, most of the cotton was done in the Lancashire cotton fields, uh, in the cotton uh, things there. 
And when the uh, Southerners came over to us, uh, they were appalled by the way the mill owners treated the people working within the mill in Lancashire. And they said, quite frankly, we wouldn't treat our slaves the way you, pe you treat people in, um, uh, in England. Um, and, and these are not slaves. Um, so uh, and the English did nearly go to war on one or two occasions when the American Navy did try to stop uh, British ships trying to get back with cotton or trying to take help out to the South. I think the British on the whole rather favoured the South, although there was an incredible guilt complex about uh, slavery, especially in this country. And I remember as a child, my grandmother gave me um, a book about Livingston, Dr. Livingston, and she emphasised the big thing he did was to get rid of slavery. And, and I think um, it big, big, play a big role. And over the years, the South has gone into those people who had slavery and the North has gone, oh, they got rid of it. And that's coming more and more to light, especially when Black Lives Matter these days. It, it's quite a noticed change in how the report is, is, is coming across. There's, there's a lot of talk about the causes of the American Civil War, and slavery was only a small part of it. Uh, well, funny enough, researching this talk, I would have agreed with you. I mean, Lincoln did say, I will do anything to keep the states together. But ironically, they've now got, and I suggest you might want to look it up, they've got a, a lecturer in history, a general from West Point, who's giving the talk about why slavery, uh, that was the main reason for the war. Uh, and it was a, just an interesting perspective. Is this a form of, of guilt? Is this a, a movement as a consequence of what's happened over the summer, over this year rather, but in particularly uh, in, in America? Um, I don't know, I wouldn't like to get involved in that, but the fact that a very senior member of West Point is now publishing this, you sit back and think they weren't doing that even two years ago. Dr. John, on behalf of everyone at the Lodge Hope of Karachi, can I thank you very much for such a, an interesting lecture. Uh, and I'm glad that you saw a little surprise for you, your, your son joining us and his uh, father-in-law. Uh, his father-in-law, James, is a, a, a well-known past master in our province up here in Fife and Kinross. Uh, and we, we felt that we'd keep it as a little secret for from you. Uh, one of those mis I, I can't, John. I can't see James. He's there someplace, yeah, I saw him when you were talking. Uh, I, I think, Bren, uh, we've got a few questions in there, but I think just you said one thing, John, and I think it was very fitting. And I, th I think it's very fitting in what we're seeing in the, the COVID crisis as well. And you said masonry, it maintains its integrity. And I think that's a fantastic strap line if we want to use a strap line for masonry. Uh, it maintains its integrity. So thank you for that, John. Uh, so looking at the questions, and I will come back to you, Gerard. I did hear you, but let's do thank the you. first. <laughs> thank uh, you. Danny Morrison is asking, John, do we know how many Freemasons died in the war from both sides? It's something like about 40,000, I think. Uh, a phenomenal number. Um, it, it varies because body counts weren't really done that often. And again, how did you know they were Freemasons? A lot of them would go into war wearing their badges. Um, and not not their pinnies, but, you know, a badge saying, oh, I'm a Freemason or I have a, a thing. And, and this, is, this has been done since time immemorial. It was only in the Second World War. This, this was actually stopped. Thank you. My wife's just given me a gin and tonic. <laughs> Cheers. And um, it, it, it's just an interest, interesting side aspect of it. Um, there's a very good book that's been uh, written um, uh, called Freemasonry and the Great Wall, which covers a lot of this. And in fact, I published a paper um, on um, uh, Freemasonry uh, in prison camps uh, in the First World War. Uh, in particular, the ones at uh, uh, Relieven, which was a British one. And the difference between how the British treated the Germans and how the Germans treated the British. And the British were, were, were really unpleasant, whereas the Germans 
really treated us rather like we were we were civilized. Now remember, this is not the Second World War. That is a different ball game altogether. The First World War, it, it's interesting. If you get an opportunity, it was in I think the millennium or round about that time. Um, uh, there's a there's an article that I published, another one on um, uh, the organist that. Um, a Hereford Cathedral, who had gone on a walk in Germany, and he decided in, in August 1914, not very clever, and ended up in Relieven for four years. Um, and he was the, uh, the the armoner for the camp, because there were about 200 Freemasons in there. And he arranged, this is going to American Civil War, but I find it funny, and I think you will, he arranged with Grand Lodge in London that they would send parcels to the prisoners, that the uh, Freemasons in Relieven, um, and you can see them sitting there in London uh, in 1916 uh, going, uh, do we know, do we know a, 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 a caterer or something who can do parcels? Ah, oh, yes, Harrods. So overnight, all these presents, all these parcels were sent to the British Freemasons in Relieven camp by American Express, because the Americans weren't in the war at that time, to arrive within two days. You can imagine now, with the other 1,800 prisoners who are out there who are not Freemasons, how they felt about bloody Freemasons. <laughs> so it just amuses me. So you may not find it so. <laughs> no, I think that's a lovely story. We do have a question that takes us back across the pond, though, John. What's your thoughts on the Civil War in relation to the steam-powered Industrial Revolution and the lack of the need for slaves? Well, the, the big problem with the end of the war were the carpetbaggers who came down south to literally bleed and dry. Um, there was no brotherly love relief and truth for that. They were, they were on the make. At the same time, the hypocrisy of the slaves going north or going to the industrial areas, they were treated like animals. And so there was no real love for these uh, people who had endured 300 years. One interesting comment that came out of it was the fact that uh, slavery was very much on the decline at the end of the 19th, uh, 18th century. Um, they'd stopped importing slaves by about 1820 anyway, and they were using homegrown slaves. Um, so the, the whole concept was, was winding up anyway. How long it would have taken? The British obviously were stopping slavery. Most of the slaves from West Africa were going South America anyway at this time. Um, so it's interesting to know, um, would it have stopped in its own right? But the way that they treated right the way up until the Ku Klux Klan, which uh, and one or two other institutions that were going on in the South uh, in the earlier part or middle of the century, you, you can see um, they, they've never really been allowed to, to, to um, integrate. I mean, it's, it's taken a lot even now to get where they've got to. Yeah, I think, Brian, there's a, a very interesting programme on the TV just now with Samuel Jackson. And I think it's a four part documentary. Uh, if you're interested in that area where he, he traces it back to uh, the African continent and where they go north and south America, etc. Uh, and another question for you, John. Do you think the movies, Hollywood, led us astray with their portrayal of the American Civil War? Well, um, John Wayne came from Texas, which was a slave state. Um, yes, because he always plays a Union officer. Um, yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, the, the history is always written by the winners. Um, and the America uh, does a great deal. To, 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 to run down the losers. I mean, the American Indians, a classical example. Uh, and um, equally, uh, you never or rarely see um, a nice um, Southern officer. I mean, the classic thing, I think that sums it all up. That at the end of the war, two people were gonna be tried as war criminals, generally, and, um, uh, uh, Jefferson, uh, Davis, uh, the leader of the um, uh, American, the uh, president of the South. And Robert E. Lee, to get back at him, he lived at Arlington. 
uh, where the American cemetery is for the North. Uh, and, and, you know, every American who's killed abroad, his body's brought back and planted there. Uh, if, if they possibly can, there, there are exceptions, of course. <coughs> and the first half a dozen dozen corpses uh, brought back from the American Civil War were planted on Jefferson's, on uh, Robert E. Lee's lawn. Uh, as good as to say, we're going to plant our, our best on your lawn. And, and he, he was hounded for years. Um, he, they, they, there was no um, uh, anything put up against him. He was never tried or anything like that. But he, he was a gentleman, to say the least. Uh, but whatever happened, he was hounded. And a, a lot of the others were. I mean, uh, no officer in the America, in the Confederate Army uh, could ever rejoin as an officer in the Union Army in peacetime. They all came back as as rankers, and the most they could get hope to get is um, um, the rank of a, a sergeant, perhaps. But they 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 were really it's been badly treated. I mean, the, the, but the, the it's history. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 winners always write the books. I, I'd love to write the history of the Second World War, but it won't be done for a hundred years because. Someone will blame you for being anti-Semitic or anti this and anti that. And, um, uh, and it just goes on, really. Um, it, it, it's just too sensitive. We've only just now wrote the history of Napoleon that's of any, any interest, any use. So a, a couple of comments from the Bren for you, John. Support for the Union and Confederacy was split in England. Typical was Liverpool supported the Confederacy and Manchester the Union. And another comment, anti-Masonry party merged into the Whig party. The Whig party, yeah. Uh, Which then disappeared. Sorry, John. The Whigs disappeared. They were overtaken by the Democrats. So not a question. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Another one, not a question as such, but I've been to Gettysburg. I have American cousins, one who lives in a town called Mechanicsburg, where the northernmost battle took place. There is a small but packed museum of the Civil War there. So again, that's a, a, lots of us have been across. Uh, lots of really good comments. Uh, so thanks for the, your answer about the, the, the war dead. Thanks for the answer. That means as many Masons died as British civilians did in, died in the Blitz. Uh, Mark Phillips to everyone. The act- in, that was only in one battle. Yeah, amazing the, the, the numbers. Because there was something like about was it seven hundred thousand Brits died in the bombing. It was a phenomenal number. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it's been kept very quiet. Nobody talks about that anymore. The number of um, certainly London. I'm a Londoner. Um, and um, my parents, well, my mother used to talk about um, the Blitz and how they slept under the stairs and had it every night, uh, every single night for a, forever. And yeah. then, you know, it was... we, one of our friends who comes regular to this, Mark Phillips, was from the States and he puts a comment about the act prohibiting importation of slaves of 1807. Uh, as a United States federal law that provided that no new slaves were permitted to be imported into the US. It took effect on the 1st of January, 1808, the earliest date permitted by the US Constitution. Uh, Stephen O'Donnell's got another question for you, John. Also, can I ask your thought to the fact or non-fact that it was a Scot that set the precedent for legalized slavery by way of taking a slave trader to court for selling him an unhealthy slave? Well, I don't know when that was, <laughs> but it could. There was so much to do with it. I mean, I'm always fascinated by uh, um, a, a little unknown fact. Uh, uh, it's not universally known, but if you look at people with blood group B, the blood group B is very much a North African blood group, um, and uh, you 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 find it all. It's rather like in Scotland, it's blood group O. In Southeast England, it's blood group A. And, and, and that is because that's the Germanic one where the Anglo-Saxons mainly came. Um, and <clears throat> the fact that where you see a lot of blood group Bs is along 
the area from Cardiff to Bristol. And there's a little patch in Northern Ireland and a little patch in Northern Scotland. And that's because of the Moors that are in the uh, Spanish Navy. And, and again, along the Bristol Channel, it relates largely to the, um, um, the slave trade. Very interesting. Don't, don't say that all um, blacks are, are Group B because they're not. It's, it's just that the particular group that made up the slave trade at that time were Group B. I've got two more questions in the chat, then I'll come to you, Gerard. I want, one's a comment from Charlie Stewart of number two. Uh, Carlton Burial Grounds in Edinburgh, uh, which is right in the city centre of Edinburgh, John, if you don't know, is the only monument to the American Civil War outside the United States and was the first statue to a US president outside her own borders. And it's the only statue of Lincoln in Scotland. The monument owes its installation to an American Freemason. Uh, but there, there is in fact in Parliament Square you've got the monument to uh, Abraham Lincoln and then in Trafalgar Square you've got the monument to uh, Washington um, and it, it's rather ironic that we, we, we tend, to, tend to adopt our enemies <laughs> oh, I don't think Lincoln was but Washington certainly was our enemy <laughs> uh, Was it true that John Wilkes Booth was a Mason? Yes and so was Thomas Paine and, and they both, in fact, Thomas Paine um, went over and became General Sullivan in the American War of Independence. Um, uh, he was his personal servant, not servant, the secretary. Okay. Gerard, you've got a, a point. Just, a, just an observation. The, I've been to America many times to the East Coast. The thing that strikes me is that at that time, America had a population of circa 30 million. In that conflict, over 600,000 people died, 3 million were injured. So that in itself was debilitating. The thing that strikes me from the, the I learn about history is that whatever was going to happen, the bitterness, particularly of reconstruction, would continue for generations. And perhaps it's because of Freemasonry that there is a possibility that there can be some form of reconciliation the other thing I would like to point out is that, as far as we're aware, um, the President um, Lincoln wasn't a Mason. He was a fraternal brother of Pythus, but not a Mason. And I think um, D Davison was, um, Jefferson Davis also wasn't a Freemason. These, these are just small points. Uh, Lincoln is said to have been very interested in Freemasonry. And he, he said that, when I get time, I would like to learn more. And uh, this is interesting in the fact he didn't get time. Um, he, he died watching was it, our, our English cousins in a play in, um, in, in, in Washington. Yes, sir. So uh, it, it, it is, would he have become a Freemason? I, I don't know. Um, he was a lawyer. Uh, he, he, all, he always looked like he's suffering from terminal tuberculosis to me, but um, he's a skinny, gaunt face, you know, but, uh, they've had great problems with uh, stopping his body being pinched. Um, uh, so they've actually, he's actually buried in a block of concrete right now, which so many American prisoners are <laughs> on propping up motorways. <laughs> John, you, you, you touched there uh, on a little bit of a medical matter. And one of our questions from one of our regular uh, guests, Brother Sandy Thompson, he asked you, as a medical man, would you care to say words a few words on your opinion of the current pandemic. Um, I retired uh, from um, medical microbiology. I, I was an academic. I wasn't medically qualified, or, although my degree is in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, I was a medical microbiologist. So, yes, this is my field. Um, things have changed. Uh, a lot's changed. I mean, I one of the things that I find amusing is in this year when we've had so much, we hear a bit about the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918, which actually caused the end of the First World War because the German army could no longer hold the line. Uh, it, was, it was one of the causes, there were others. But the other thing is the fact that nobody's mentioned the 1957 Asian flu epidemic. Now, I was in my first year at grammar school at the time, and I remember that I got it very early on, and yes, you do feel like death warmed up when, 
when you've got it, even if you're only 11 years of age. Um, but more people caught that than actually caught the Spanish flu. And do you know why it was called the Spanish flu? It was called the Spanish flu because the Spanish army were the only ones who admitted to having it. It was actually, should have been called the North Carolina flu um, because that's where it came from. And it's one of the very flu, most flus come out of, of um, influenza until we're not, we've got a, we don't have colds anymore, do we? We have flu. We don't have headaches anymore. We have migraines. We exaggerate. Most influenzas actually come out of uh, Canton around that area. And, and, and there's reasons for that. And it's not the Chinese being difficult. It's just uh, it starts off as in, a, in birds and then goes into a secondary animal, which is a pig. And you, it's a mathematical calculation. And the only areas where you have that sort of number of pigs and birds is in Canton and in uh, the Mississippi, Missouri River Basin. And so if it's going to come from anywhere, that's where it invariably comes from. Not always. Someone will write in and say, this didn't come from there. Uh, but the, Spanish, the Asian influenza um, just uh, has been forgotten. And yet there were 100,000 schoolboys in London, school children in London. At the height of that, they were off sick. 100,000. Um, uh, I, I actually used to teach uh, what would you do in the case of an epidemic? Um, and the only one where it's been, and I, for Grand Lodge, I actually wrote a number of articles uh, for the MCF, the Masonic Charitable Foundation. I wrote a number of articles explaining the difference between a virus and a bacteria and what's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And I've been basically proved right. The only thing where I got it wrong it, back in February was when um, I was expecting it to attack the young and it didn't. It went for the old. And that I really can't get my head around why. Uh, it, it's clearly it's the same thing. You get this cytokine rush, uh, which your body overreacts and then you die. I mean, flu in 1918 was a three day illness and then you were dead. Um, it wasn't a fortnight of sick. You were three days and it attacked the young because the young are more physically uh, or more immunologically active to be able to respond better than old people like you and me, um, who we're past our cell by date. I mean, one of the talks I used to give at the university was, what is the true age of a human being? And what's our life expectancy? And you can compare it by the not only the microbiological flora, but the in introduction of diseases that hit us. And the life expectancy of a human being as a hunter-gatherer living in Africa 10,000, 15,000 years ago is 35. So we're all past our cell pill by date three or four times over. Um, and you can see this by the maximum childbearing age is 14 to 28 in a woman. And yet most women now are trying to get pregnant at 40. A lot of women are, not nice, are trying to get pregnant at 40 and wonder why they can't. It's because they're basically past their cell by date. And, and, and again, what happens with us? We get to our, uh, our, our uh, mid 40s and our eyes start packing up. Uh, by our 60s, our immune system's buggered and we begin to get cancers. We get to 85 and one third of people at 85 will have dementia and a half at 90. And the average age going into the Masonic care homes, which I'm partly responsible for in, in, in England, is 92 and a half now. Everybody thinks back, and think, well, people go to care homes at 75. Well, they, in, in, in the 1960s and 70s, they did. Now, who's going to go in a care home when you're paying £1,500 a week or whatever? It depends on where you are and what, what you're doing. When you're fit and healthy and your legs work and your arms work, it's only when you've got something really wrong with you that you want to go into a care home. But I'm diverting into other things yeah. now. No, are... John, John, thank you very much. We, when we do have our guest speakers from different airs and perts, as we say up here, we do like to get their... their uh, informed opinion on the, the current crisis as well. It just keeps us all grounded. Uh, but once... you're, hanged, you're hanged if you do, and you're hanged if you don't. I mean, uh, currently, I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not in love with politics at all, whoever it is. And if you've got a situation where you're running the country and you're slowly bankrupting because you're giving all the people money out there to stay out of work, 
And then you're confronted with people saying, well, you've got to keep them out because they're all spreading the disease. As, as a prime minister, and I'm not sticking up for what's his name. As a prime minister, you've got to weigh both sides up. And let's be honest, you're hanged if you do and you're hanged if you don't. Um, yeah. It's a terrible position they're in. No, very much so. John, on behalf of the Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our visitors here this evening for our 33rd lockdown lecture, can I give you a huge thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation on the American Civil War. I can just see all the, the hands are clapping there. Uh, what we do now, John, is I, I just give a couple of intimations and then we open the mics and everybody can say their, their own personal thank yous uh, and good nights to you. So, Brian, uh, next week, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be very kind to you because the dark nights are in, it's raining and it's wet, and we've got a presentation from Brother Jay De Costa, uh, and he's going to talk to us about the unique Masonic Temple of Lisbon. So we're going to Portugal, Brian, it's going to be sun, sea, and whatever else you can think of with S that happens in these uh, sunny resorts. And I can see you smiling, Brother Ronnie Forbes. Uh, with that comment. Uh, so, Brian, thank you once again. Uh, the conversation will continue uh, on the Facebook pages, so please put any other comments in, and please feel free to unmute yourself and say your thank yous and good nights. Brother John Ryder, thank you very much, sir. My thank you, John. 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 Very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John. Thank you. I'll give you my review tomorrow, Dad. Good night, John. Good to see you, Tony Sayer. Good night. You too. Like Tony. Looking well. Taking after you. Thank you, John, and a big thanks to Gordon for putting on the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Excellent. Thanks. You really enjoyed it. Anytime, Good night, everyone. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Good you, night. brother John. Very informative. Thank you, Gordon. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Gordon. I hope one day I can come up. I hope one day I can come up and see you in real life. Yes, no, very much so. You know where we are, uh, and that's a big part of these uh, lectures. When we get back to normality, we've had over 2,500 people visit us, uh, some for 33 times, but we do hope to see them all face-to-face -face in the future, particularly our guest lecturers. I've heard your, I've heard your initiation of communication is quite violent. We stop these companies, we don't do it like that. <laughs> No, we'll be gentle. We'll be gentle. Oh, right then, Brian, I'm going to give you five. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, Brother John. John. And I'll see you soon. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all, brethren. Take care, Brian. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good night. I'm turning on. Good night, Brian. Cheers. Bye. Three. Yes, Ronnie, it is sangria. Yes. That's not what I'd be doing in Portugal, but that's the best one. Good evening, Bill, and good night. <laughs>